as you will have seen, uh, the topic today is impact investment. That is to say, uh, investing with the aim of uh, achieving positive and uh, measurable uh, social impact or social or environmental impact and outcome uh, in addition to financial returns or at least generally in addition to financial returns not always necessarily the case as the market does include purely philanthropic investment looking to achieve solely impact returns uh, as yet uh, it's only very recent days that, that um, attempts have been made to assess the total size of the impact investing market uh, the best current guess for the present year is a figure in the region of $750 billion. Um, looking back in our own archive, I, I see that the one previous time that, uh, that we visited this topic in these meetings was at the beginning of 2017. And uh, although information is, is not conclusive, it would appear that even since that comparatively brief time, uh, the market has at least doubled. Uh, looking to the future as well, it is of course the case that in not all that much more than a year's time, uh, we will be seeing what is probably the most significant event environmentally on the planet, that is the COP26 conference, which will be taking place where I am here in Scotland um, in November of next year, as you will all know. So it can only be that environmental and climate crisis issues are going to become even more conspicuous than they already are. So for all of these reasons, therefore, um, we feel that it's opposite to uh, address this uh, topic today. So uh, our meeting will have the usual format. We will have a series of presentations for you, uh, followed by uh, opportunities for question and answer. And we have three front rank speakers for you today, leading lights in the impact investment world, and I will introduce these as we go along. Uh, but before we do so, can I remind you that the technology allows us the luxury of asking questions in real time as we go along. Uh, you do that via the chat button, as I'm sure most of you will know, uh, which you'll find in most cases, I think, at the, the foot of your screen, somewhere around your screen anyway. Um, so please, can we encourage you to send in the questions as they occur to you? Uh, we have uh, a team of Jeffy IT elves behind the scenes who will be uh, collating these and um, uh, we'll get through as many as we can in the latter stages of the meeting. So uh, let's press on then with the business of the day and our first speaker today is Dean Hand. Uh, Dean is the research director with the Global Impact Investing Network uh, which describes itself as the global champion of impact investing. Uh, Dean's own background is, uh, has involved the development of impact funds within emerging markets. Um, and she also lectures at uh, postgraduate level in impact investment. So um, uh, she seems the ideal person to give us a, an opening conspectus of the whole um, uh, the, the whole impact investment market and uh, what opportunities and challenges it's currently facing, uh, not least, of course, in light of the uh, upheavals brought upon us all by the COVID crisis. Uh, Dean is in New York and so she has very kindly got up early to speak to us today and I will now hand over to you, Dean. Thank you, Graham. Um, I'm delighted to be with you today um, to share work about impact investing strategies that really have the potential to make a real difference in the world. One of the cornerstones of what we do at the Global Impact Investing Network, GIN for short, um, is to advance the scale and effectiveness of impact investing. It's to provide insights um, from impact investors themselves, those that have practical experience in the field, and I have the privilege of being able to share some of these findings with you today. Based on our annual impact investor survey, and we've been doing them for over 10 years now, I'll frame the impact investing sector, um, provide some insight on the market size, which Graham has alluded to already, um, some of the latest trends and opportunities and challenges specifically. In addition, I'm also gonna share with you some of the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic um, and what that has meant for impact investors specifically. 
so let's begin. I'm going to share my screen. There we go. Hold on. Okay. Um, this year, the GIN conducted um, the 10th edition of our annual survey. Um, the survey is the, the most comprehensive yet um, and, look, and really looked at the size of the market and then activities of impact investors around the world, especially in a COVID context. There are four key findings of the survey, but to specifically to tease out the challenges and opportunities, um, I'm going to focus on two specifically. Finally, I'm going to end off with some direction on where you can find more research insights from the gin, but as well as others, um, before I hand back to Graham. Um, the gin um, has developed a market sizing methodology very specifically that has built a database collating the assets under management of over 1,700 organizations, impact investing organizations from around the world. And as a consequence, we estimate that the um, size of the market is about 715 billion. Um, based on this analysis, um, you will see that um, it's a, for a market that is growing and still relatively young and sits comfortably alongside analogous markets that similarly consider social and environmental impact results in their investment processes. This figure represents a significant supply of capital um, that has the capacity to address some of the world's most pressing problems. Furthermore, it's growing and growing in a variety of ways. And what I'm going to share with you is the ways in which that is happening by talking to you about some of the findings of the annual survey itself. There are four key findings, as you can see here. Um, as I've referenced earlier, I'm going to focus on three and four specifically in order to offer insights that might be useful to all of you. Impact measurement and management, IMM for short. Um, practices specifically that we believe have matured, um, but there still are opportunities for improvement. The promise of impact investing still remains very positive, despite the fact that due to COVID, there are difficult economic consequences and lots of market uncertainty. Two factors that in impact investors and in investors um, do not like, um, but as we'll show you, investors still do see opportunities. Here are some of the quick characteristics from, the, from respondents to the survey, just to give you some context. 294 impact investing organizations around the world responded to our survey and told us about their investment activity up until the end of 2019. We were acutely aware of the fact that we were collecting data January to March this year at the, at the height of the pandemic. I'll share with you a little later how we incorporated the impact of the pandemic. 67% of them seek risk adjusted market rate returns. They are headquartered in about four, in 46 countries and most are from organization types that focus all their activity on impact investing. The balance will use carve outs and various other strategies to focus their, um, their um, work. The majority have entered the, in, um, the industry in the last decade. Impact measurement and management is, practice is a key tenant of impact investing. What we found in the research is that it has matured and deepened, but as I mentioned earlier, there are still opportunities for refinement. Before we delve a little deeper, I want to point out two challenges noted by investors that su and suggest that within those lie key opportunities. The first is that respondents believe that areas in which the most progress has been made are in the areas of research on market activity, which is an essential tool for investors, especially new entrants, to understand the market, where and how to best focus their efforts. And secondly, in the sophistication of impact measurement and management. We'll share a little more on this later. The second issue is this, that over the next five years, investors are concerned about impact washing. Indeed, this is a challenge for the integrity of the industry. One of the strongest ways to 
address this, this concern is through the rigor of impact measurement and management practices, a significant focus of the GIN and many others' work. The annual survey's third finding uncovers this a little further, and let's see how they do so. Firstly, they intentionally target specific impact returns. Nearly every single respondent targets social impact, about, um, about 94%. About six in 10 investors target both social and environmental impact. What this tells us is, is that most investors see social and environmental targets are interrelated. When we break this down by target return philosophy, we see that over two thirds of market rate investors target both social and environmental impact. And as you can see from the next slide, there is a growing global consensus around the UN's sustainable development goals, broadly speaking, and especially within the impact investing industry. There is huge diversity in the types of impact areas that, that investors target. The majority target decent work, SDG 8, as well as poverty, SDG 1. Whereas a smaller percentage of respondents target peace, justice, and strong institutions, just 16%. It's probably because it's quite a hard area to find deal flow specifically. In terms of investors measuring their impact results, the average investor uses at least three such resources, resources being frameworks, tools, and systems to fulfill complementary purposes. Purposes being to set targets, to measure them, and then to report on their impact results. The SDGs are the most common across all purposes. Whereas IRIS and IRIS Plus being the generally accepted system for measuring and managing and optimizing impact are mainly used to measure and report on impact. Thinking back to the very first annual impact investor survey from 2010, the findings indicated that 85% of respondents to that survey used their own proprietary framework to measure impact. And now, 10 years later, we see that 89% of respondents use external resources to measure their impact. This is a significant evolution that goes a long way to addressing concerns such as impact washing. While nearly half of the respondents strongly agree that their organizations have increased its impact IMM rigor, still opportunities remain, in particular on independent verification and the ability to compare impact performance with peers. Addressing these will also help um, reduce any threat of impact washing. The industry is actively working on these areas. Of course, the impact performance work of the gin but also other industry initiatives, some, such as Harvard's impact weighted accounts and efforts like the International Finance Corporation's operating principles. As I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, we collected data from respondents for the survey as the most pervasive and widespread pandemic the world has ever seen was playing out. We went back to our respondents specifically and asked them how this was affecting them. The results were illuminating and have spurned further work that has helped to guide investors during this time. Firstly, let's contextualize investors' COVID response in terms of their financial and impact performance expectations pre-COVID. Similar to patterns that we've seen in past years, 88% of respondents indicated that they are meeting or exceeding their financial performance targets, and an impressive 99% are achieving their impact performance targets. In a COVID context, as expected, investors do see significant change in their risk profiles of their investments. 81% indicate that the overall risk has changed as a result of the pandemic, unsurprisingly, and 43% believe that the impact risk has changed. Understandably then, in the wake of COVID, um, investors are expecting a level of underperformance. 46% of respondents believe that their impact performance, um, impact portfolio will underperform against financial targets and 16% on impact targets. However, 18% believe that their portfolio will outperform against impact targets. Despite these headwinds, most respondents to the survey 
plan to maintain or increase their capital commitments to impact investing in these difficult times. Following on from these findings, the GIN formed a coalition, an industry initiative accelerating impact investments to respond, to recover, and to build resilience, R3 for short, in the face of COVID-19. This coalition has developed specific research pieces to address specific challenges that investors face, like how to conduct due diligence in a distanced, uncertain context, especially as priorities for investors and investees are changing at a very fast pace. And you'll see there some of the key takeaways from that research. With that, I'm going to summarize. I hope that these findings that I've given you um, offer insight into how impact investors today are engaging in these strategies to realize the promise of impact investing, using capital to address the world's most pressing challenges, whether that be quality jobs, access to markets for small scale farmers or affordable housing, just to name a few examples. The impact investing market's strength comes from its growing size, its diversity, the depth of its growth, IMM practices and its ability to address serious challenges at difficult times. In fact, the promise of impact investing is most relevant now in these, in these times. It remains for me just to let you know that we have far more resources, so please do reach out if you need further information. And with that, I'll hand back to Graham. Um, I hope I wasn't meant to hand over to Amy, but hopefully, Graham, you can um, lead us in, into the next section. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Dean. Uh, uh, you managed to cram a huge amount into that and a great deal of uh, food for thought and I suspect food for questions. And uh, could I just uh, remind everyone, please bring your questions into us and, and we will uh, deal with these at the end. But we're, we're going to have all three presentations before we get to the questions and answers stage. Uh, so on now to our second speaker, uh, who, who is uh, Amy Clark. Uh, Amy is the Chief Impact Officer, which seems like the perfect job title for this afternoon, uh, with uh, Tribe Impact Capital. Uh, Tribe are a, a, a firm of uh, wealth managers specialising in the uh, impact sector uh, and who uh, focus on developing strategies aligned to particular investors' uh, aims and values. Uh, Amy's own background is very much in the environmental field, um, and she can claim 25 years of experience in sustainable business and uh, impact evaluation. And uh, so we'll look forward to hearing what she's got to say about the challenges in uh, currently facing the impact investment world. And I'm sure she will be picking up on some of the themes already raised by uh, Dean in relation to uh, impact measurement and uh, impact washing, which was a new term to me, but uh, uh, I, uh, I knew what it means. At least I think I do. Uh, so, uh, Amy, can we hand over to you and we'll be uh, very interested to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Graham, and, and thank you to the team at Jeffy as well for the very kind invitation to join you today and, and to talk. I will pick up on some of what Dean has just, um, just been talking about, but um, I was actually asked to muse on three things, um, which were the current trends in impact investing, uh, whether COVID has dented the demand for impact investing, and my view of, and I quote, an enlightened post-pandemic economy, which I am going to do, but I'm not going to do them in that order. Um, I actually wanted to reflect first on the title of this conference. By the way, I don't have any slides, so I apologize for everyone. You're just going to have to look at me for about the next 15 minutes. Um, but I wanted to reflect first on the title of the conference, um, Can Impact Investing Save Capitalism? Now, ever since Omar and Chris um, uh, asked if I would be um, available to speak at this, I've been asking myself the same question. Rather than can we, should we save capitalism? And if so, what role does impact investing have? Now, for some people, that question is a little bit like asking whether vaping can save the tobacco industry. Now, smarter people than me have, um, have tried to answer this question over the last few, few years, but as an impact investor, I wanted to share with you my thoughts from the front line, so to speak. The first question as humans, we nearly always ask ourselves is, is it broken? And if so, can it be fixed? 
rather than why did it break and did it break because it's fundamentally and functionally the wrong tool for the job in hand. Now we built a finance system. It's a linear system that deals with tangible assets that are commoditized in the pursuit of profits. It is in many ways a very, very simple system. It's an industrial system though where assets are real and tradable, but it's unintended consequences are all around us at the moment. A system that prioritizes profit by its very nature has sacrifice coded in that results in inequality and inequity. And whilst the system we built has remained largely static over time, the ecosystem we inhabit hasn't. So those inequities and those inequalities have grown. And we now live in an intangible world, not an industrial world, an intangible world where the inputs and the threats to the system we built are non-linear and they're increasingly molecular and invisible in nature. So those threats, the inputs, are a response largely to the system we've built, but they've always been there. And I remember working at Microsoft in the noughties as their sustainability lead in the UK. We sent out patch after patch to fix what were fundamental design flaws. These were weaknesses in the system that were exploited by those wanting to corrupt the software for game. Um, and it very much reminds me of where we are now. We, we've sort of conditioned ourselves to think that patches are acceptable. Well, they're not. You know, impact investing should not in any way be considered a patch. Um, we need to tackle the fundamental weaknesses in the system, uh, and that's wealth and our definition of it and its purpose. And this is where impact investing helps seed the conditions for sustainable life on Earth. Rather than a patch, it's fundamentally tackling the design weaknesses by offering a recode of the operating system and how we engage with and think about wealth. And I think we need to be really clear here that a reboot of the system simply won't suffice. It's not enough. This is about a system upgrade, hardware and software. And impact investing is not the whole solution, but it's part of it, along with changes to company law as an example, fiduciary responsibility, accounting standards, macroeconomic theory, political reformation, taxation, citizenship engagement. You know, the list is endless, but given how embedded the finance system is, in all of these areas, impact investing becomes a very, very powerful source of new code and one that in a post-pandemic economy seeds the conditions for two things critical um, in that economy. First, it drives us back into that safe space where we and every other life form can thrive. And second, and really importantly, it keeps us there. Any aspirational coding that does less than that, frankly, is a game of Russian roulette with over 7 billion lives and up to a trillion other forms of life. So what is the current situation with impact investing and what are we witnessing in terms of the trends, the collaborations and the hacks that are happening in the system and that are likely to happen in the future? Well, let's look at the last eight months and look at whether or not um, enthusiasm and demand for impact investing has in any way been dented, which was one of the questions I was asked to focus on. No, it hasn't. Um, we've seen some of that from obviously the research that Dean has just uh, presented to us. Um, we've also all probably seen the media coverage of the record inflows of capital into ESG funds um, and their increased resilience um, over their non-ESG counterparts in the face of this current global crisis. Global sustainable um, funds recorded £37 billion worth of inflows over the first quarter of 2020 and the sector completely avoided the COVID-19 market sell-off over the first quarter of this year as well, that saw 384, roughly speaking, about $384 billion withdrawn from the overall fund universe. Now, those are statistics from Morningstar. Europe continued continue to dominate the, that specific space, that ESG space. But over the last year, a third of the money flowing into global funds has been committed. Sorry, there's a police car going past right outside my house. Um, over the last year, a third of the money flowing into global funds has been committed to those focused on ESG investments. But in June and July of this year, so the last two months, this proportion has risen to more than half. So it's clear that demand for ESG has, has ignited, but ESG is not impact investing. Let's be clear. It's better investing. It's risk adjusted invest investing, recognizing the broader set of risks that a company faces. Um, it's part of an approach to impact investing, but it is in itself not impact investing. And I think the recent uh, controversies that we've seen, for example, around Boohoo is a good example of the inherent flaws in ESG, given Boohoo was sitting in some ESG funds. However, if we look at ESG 
as a marker for market sentiment, it's a great bellwether of changes that are afoot. And our own experience as a boutique dedicated impact wealth manager um, over this last eight month period is that the demand has certainly not dried up. In, in fact, quite the opposite. Um, April was our busiest month uh, to date in terms of account opening and the pace of engagement um, has been and continues to be happily uh, quite relentless. So given we know uh, what's happening with capital flows um, and given we know where we need to get to um, and the type of post pandemic economy we're, we're looking to achieve, what are we seeing out in the marketplace now that is going to support this seismic shift needed? Um, I've quickly summarized 10, 10 areas that we are very excited about at, at, at Tribe. You know, first, and Dean's already alluded to this, is the shift in the accounting practices that are being supported by impact investors requiring better disclosure. The Impact Weighted Accounting Initiative, which Dean has mentioned over at Harvard and George Serafim in partnership with the Impact Management Project and the Global Steering Group on Impact Investing, is a really good example of this. Uh, and we think this new age in accountancy will drive transparency and disclosure um, of the liabilities and the externalities associated uh, with those liabilities on balance sheet. And it potentially heralds a new lens through which companies are valued. So we probably all saw, I think it was last week, Apple is now worth two trillion. When it's natural and human capital liabilities are factored in, I can guarantee you that Apple is not worth two trillion dollars. So we need more honest, accurate and transparent reporting of the true cost of running a business and the true value of a business. And this is where impact investing can play a role in demanding these types of disclosures, much, very much like the conditions that have been set out for disclosure by the TCFD. Um, the second area is the shifts in the interpretation of fiduciary duty. So we've already seen the US Department of Labor announce regressive changes to how pension funds in the US should or in this case should not engage with ESG funds. And this has catapulted them into a war of words and wills with some of the big institutional houses in the US, for example, State Street, who've publicly condemned this move, citing fiduciary duty as the reason why ESG matters. So we believe that fiduciary duty is set to take center stage over the next months and the next you know, few years with impact investors already able to clearly demonstrate that our approach to investing is fiduciary duty in practice. And given that, and given the performance that we're able to generate off that, we hope that others will follow quickly. We also think that there will be uh, the deployment, or the development, the deployment of more meaningful benchmarks. Um, again, something that Dean alluded to, it will be a shift from our, our eternal obsession with growth to benchmarks that better demonstrate how we are seeding the conditions uh, where we thrive. Um, benchmarks will be used to better understand the true nature of the performance of the business and, and funds alike. Um, the European Union um, uh, Technical Expert Group on Sustainable Finance is, is already leading the charge here um, in the proposal of low carbon benchmarks, ESG benchmarks, etc. and more will follow. Um, impact investors, you know, we're already starting to use our own impact benchmarks. Um, so for example, when we report to our clients where we can aggregate and attribute uh, data, and I'll come on to data late, late, um, later, uh, we um, report benchmarks around um, temperature pathways um, in alignment with the Paris Climate Accord, absolute carbon emissions, and gender benchmarks. And those are non-negotiable three benchmarks that go out across all of our client portfolios. And clients will continue to demand more as the media focus more and more and more on this, and more comes into the market. I think we'll also see more regulatory pressure for disclosure and standards alongside these benchmarks um, to try and stem sometimes what seems like the tide of green and rainbow washing. They are gray, and there's a couple more terms for you. Green and rainbow washing uh, that is happening. Um, again, the EU are in a pole position here and are leading the charge, um, as are the likes of the British Standards Institute and their PAS guidance notes. So thresholds will be set. Um, and in the absence of thresholds, our belief is that the industry itself and society at large will hold offenders to account. Data, and Dean has obviously spent a, a reasonable amount of time in her presentation talking about some of the challenges with this. Now, data coverage and quality is, and it will continue to improve. Um, Microsoft's recent teaming up with BlackRock is a sign of greater technology engagement with data, and the rise of machine learning and AI as part and parcel of an approach to impact investing. Now, does this mean that the passive uh, investors will rule? No, it won't. 
impact investing is too nuanced and too complex at the moment for a true data driven, data -driven approach. Um, we only need to look at the impact reporting challenges um, that are around in the marketplace and that Dean again has just recently alluded to. You know, we have data paucity, meaning often we have to rely on qualitative information in the absence of quant. Um, and B, we have data manipulation. So we have a what sometimes seems like a proliferation of impact calculators reporting uh, supposed impact metrics. Um, let's be clear, they're not impact, they're output metrics. Um, but that out of context can be meaningless and misleading. Um, and again, as Dean's mentioned, databases like IRIS really help us navigate some of these challenges around impact reporting and help us really focus on the measures that truly articulate the change that is happening and whether or not this new economic reality that we are all in the process of developing and deploying is driving the change that is required. Citizenship empowerment will continue. So the recent launch here in the UK of the Make My Money Matter campaign, um, demanding greater disclosure of the pension industry is a really good example of how consumers are demanding greater transparency from the finance sector. And this is set to continue and it will only reinforce the approach that impact investors are taking in setting the bar high and reporting transparently. We will all, all of us on this call will become more engaged with what our wealth is creating and what it is destroying. And we will be demanding far more of those we work with and rely on. ESG will never be enough. It isn't currently, it won't be. And citizens are starting to wake up to this. Transition agreements um, and the rise of unionization in the pursuit of the protection of workers' rights as we shift this new post-pandemic economy and we focus on a green recovery. Now, this is set to play a really prominent role in the coming months, and it's something that impact investors are acutely aware of. Um, as businesses at risk of structural decline or obsolescence as a result of the shift that's happening will demand just and fair transitions to this new economic paradigm. Workers' rights will be centre stage, not just in transition parlance, but also as part of crisis management, given we know that there are other crises looming on the horizon. Um, temperature pathways will also become a de facto metric with more and more clarity as to the warming pathways at business level um, against the legal backdrop of the Paris um, Climate Agreement. We are likely to see far more net zero declarations, but we will also see the rise of temperature pathways and targets um, being set at business level and within the system, within the finance system. Um, the Science-Based Targets Initiative is leading the charge here. To date, there are 950 signatories around the world and they represent about 10% of global GDP. Only 55 of those are finance houses. We're one. We've set a science, uh, we've signed up to the science-based targets. The launch of the finance sector methodology is happening next month in New York as part of climate, um, Global Climate Week. And we hope and we expect as a result of that that the number of finance houses uh, setting uh, science-based targets will rise. Um, the ivory tower is not going to be ivory anymore. With more women in finance coming through and more senior women in finance coming through as well, the conditions are being set for a far more diverse and inclusive finance system, which is what we need in a post-pandemic um, economy. Where women thrive, we know as impact investors through the lens of gender lens investing, much like a Trojan horse, broader diversity and inclusion changes occur, including increases in representation of ethnicity, sexuality, age, socioeconomic background, etc. Um, the nature of the human capital in the system is and it will continue to change. It's inevitable and it's already happening. Diversity and inclusion will become key drivers in democratizing access to the system and will result in a system more balanced and representative of the society it serves. Now that's a wholesale shift from the current system that requires society to serve it. And again, as impact investors, we're already here. We're leading the charge, both in terms of how we invest, but also how we govern ourselves. Big call, GDP will be laid to rest. Um, real measures of a nation's health will emerge. They're already emerging. They will continue to emerge and they will focus um, on current and emergent economic theory. So for example, the great work that Kate Raworth has done through Donut Economics, um, which we're actually seeing now being deployed at city level and the views and the work of Mariana Mazzucato. Um, we will see previously ignored economic inputs being valued. So for example, the care economy. Um, my call is that other orthodoxies will also be removed um, or evolved, which will include things like modern portfolio theory and the flawed assumptions it's based on. Um, 
dogmas hopefully will die and we won't be replacing them with new dogmas. There will be a wave of creativity that floods the system and it's happening now. Impact investors are and are continuing to push the envelope in terms of what new thinking is required. We are never static uh, as an investment community. I think in the immortal words of the late Sir Ken Robinson here in, in the UK, curiosity is the engine of achievement and the one thing impact investors are is curious. The stellar rise of mission is going to continue, the global rise of the B Corp movement, the baked in resilience we all have, tribe is a B Corp, um, to market downturns and, and the shifting consumer sentiment has caught both investor and big business attention alike. It's also caught state attention, which is really, really interesting. So we're seeing a deployment of new company laws, which will be game changing. You know, the recent shift to an entreprise à mission in France by Danone is testament that leading businesses are really starting to pivot and understand what purpose and mission means for their business. And in the UK, we have Operation Upgrade, again being championed by the B Corps um, movement, which is establishing a more open and uh, more creative dialogue about company law reformation. And I think finally, the other area that I think is, is, uh, is going to become more and more and more visible um, as part of a post-pandemic um, economy, but also as a trend in impact investing is tax. Um, uh, we're going to see a lot about tax. Um, we've already seen tax, um, uh, we've already seen uh, tax um, being referenced in pandemic bailouts. Um, so we've seen bailout packages in multiple countries around the world being linked to tax avoidance and creative accounting techniques. Um, we currently have a tech tax on the table in the UK, as there are in other countries. We've also seen much more vocal um, calls for action from a cohort of global um, wealth holders calling for greater taxation at the top of the wealth spectrum. So tax is going to be one of those next frontiers in impact investing, but also tax is going to take centre stage in a post pandemic uh, uh, economy. So if I get back to the kind of my original musing, which was uh, the title of the conference and can impact investing save capitalism. Um, I think the question we probably need to ask ourselves is can capitalism survive the wave of hacks currently in the system and those coming or will it emerge as something new and profoundly different. Um, certainly if the conversations I think happening now that I'm aware of that I'm involved in that others on this call will be involved in as well or anything to go by, there is absolutely no lack of creative thinking and knowledge out there in driving the changes that are required. Um, that being so, it's going to come down to whether we can harness our courage and be prepared to call it wrong in the pursuit of doing what's right. And if we can, then I think it looks like we might be set for a third iteration of uh, an economic paradigm akin to the Renaissance. And yes, impact investing will have played a huge role in that and it will continue to be a huge part of it. I will finish now and breathe. Graham, you've just- going to come back to me now. Right. <laughs> I, I hope so. Well, thank, thank, th uh, thank you very, very much. I mean, it was a, a, a tour de force um, and a huge amount crammed into the, 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 the allotted space. I, I was very struck actually by how positive and optimistic so much of what you're saying was, uh, as well, uh, uh, along with the detail, uh, when we're hearing so much negativity and, and, and uh, downbeat commentary in, 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 uh, in the last few months. Uh, I think that you, you've, you've provoked quite enough there to, to fill the rest of the meeting with questions, I'm quite sure, but we'll, uh, we will come back to you on some of those. Uh, in the meantime, there's a sort of west-east trajectory in our speakers today. Uh, Dean, as I said, was in New York. Um, Amy was speaking there from Oxfordshire, and we now zoom right across to Malaysia for our final eminent speaker, who is Asna Mokhtar. Um, I, I, I won't take time to tell you all about his uh, current uh, academic uh, uh, appointment, so that would take the rest of this meeting. Uh, but suffice to say, within the, within the UK, he is currently a distinguished visiting fellow at the Centre of Development Studies at Cambridge University, as well as being a fellow at Darwin College, Cambridge, and as I say, many other posts. But I think what's most germane to what we're discussing today is that for no less than 14 years, up to 2018, uh, uh, Asman was the uh, managing director of Kazana, 
the uh, Sovereign Strategic Investment Fund of Malaysia. Uh, and under his um, oversight, not only did this more than triple in its uh, portfolio value, but uh, uh, he oversaw its uh, progression to, to world leading status uh, in the field of responsible investment and in, uh, not least uh, impact investment. So we'll be very interested to hear a bit more in detail about uh, his work there. Uh, and um, as it says on the slide, we're now looking at the building true value project and how it was possible to achieve both social and financial returns. And I'm hoping he will also give his views on the uh, post-COVID economic world. So uh, over to you, Asna. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Graham and uh, Omar, Chris, Dean, Amy, and everybody. It's always a privilege uh, to speak on the Jeffy platform. What I thought I'll do, I've got my timer ticking, and my daughter helped me to put this up. So apologies from this technophobe. <laughs> uh, if things go wrong, but I'll, in the next 15 minutes, I thought I'll just kind of give, um, you know, a sense of what I was privileged to, to do over a 14 year period, right? At a time when it started in 2004, just to give a bit of context, uh, for us in Asia, we were still kind of licking our wounds from the Asian financial crisis of 98 to 2000. So, you know, the corporate landscape and indeed the economic landscape needed quite a bit of fixing. Uh, the second comment I would say to contextualize the period is also, uh, as you know, in 04, uh, the notion of a shareholder economy was really front and center still. The, the, the notion of uh, you know, share, the shareholder value movement as opposed to the notion of a stakeholder economy that is, as we have heard from both Dean and Amy and others, uh, is very much you know, part of that quite strong mainstream with and without the washers, as, as, as we have heard, like, whether it's green, rainbow, or I've even heard about a blue wash. Blue wash is basically the color of the United Nations uh, flag because of the SDGs, right? and I suppose rainbow washing is, is around that. So we, we were somewhat against the grain when back in 04, and I should credit my alma mater, I think I did some work at Cambridge at the master's level, uh, my background is actually investment banking. I was head of research of Solomon during the Asian crisis and very much focused on financial and markets at that time, right? But after the Asian crisis, I said, that, that's it, I'm exhausted. I took some time off <clears throat> to go to Cambridge uh, and I'm back at the Center of Development and Studies to, un to try and understand a bigger conception of value, basically, not just obviously financial, but also economic or some say strategic and all the way to societal. And I'm fascinated by the comment uh, by both Dean and, um, and Amy, the whole spectrum of, you know, from responsible to sustainable to ESG. I don't know whether I got that in the right order to impact investing, right? So obviously this whole spectrum, uh, you know, from do no harm to do some good to have real break breakthrough impact, right? Uh, you know, we, we all know there's definitional issues, but roughly we know that, you know, this is it. So that, that context, I thought I'll, I'll uh, you know, contextualize first. Uh, the slides are on the busy side, so please just kind of fade out as if you're watching a movie. And I'll try to narrate because the slides were designed as a bit like, you know, in lieu of an essay, a kind of paper is meant to be read. Uh, but, you know, it will be there, but I thought I'll just highlight some of the key points, which is uh, we are often called a strategic investment fund. We're often categorized under the sovereign wealth fund category, but I'll explain later why it's not quite. Uh, by the time I finished about two years ago, we were managing, we had grown it about, you know, a bit more than about, about three and a half times with uh, incidentally no, no money coming in because the nature of Kazana is that it uh, basically, unlike other sovereign wealth funds, it did not get access to the, the oil money, for example, or the pension money or indeed the foreign exchange reserves. We basically had a bunch of, frankly, quite difficult, crappy assets that were, that were bombed out after the Asian crisis, and we had to restructure and grow, put them into market, uh, and be very careful on the liability side because we had no money coming in. But essentially, it grew to uh, about 37 billion US dollars, depending on the exchange rate. Typically, we held control major positions in about 100 major companies. 
when I started in 04, I think only about 2% of that value was overseas, but part of our strategy was to go regional. I think in particular, trying to capitalize on Malaysia's, I suppose, geographic endowment by being close to China, India, Southeast Asia, like centers of growth. And in the West, in the developed markets, actually, we, we had offices in London, in Silicon, or rather in San Francisco, who essentially invest in European and North American technology, actually. And again, you will hear that it wasn't just a financial imperative, but we were also looking at economic and strategic kind of linkages, right? So portfolio grows three and a half times. So that translates over 14 years to just under 10, well, 9.6% KGA. Uh, this is both realized and unrealized value. It's audited, et cetera. But significantly, ex ante, even at the start, we would target not just financial, but economic, which we kind of define as job creation, for example, technology acquisition, knowledge development, industrial policies in there somewhere, regional expansion, but also societal returns. I mean, the usual stuff around CSR, but also other social interventions, uh, especially on poverty and human capital development. So there's shades of you know, impact, et cetera, right? Um, and then we kind of uh, you know, dubbed this whole thing as building through value, which is essentially three conceptions of value, financial, economic, societal. Along the way, as we had heard earlier, and you know, we were doing this like 10, 12, 14 years ago, indeed there was not many metrics around, so we had to devise our own at the start. Uh, on a project called Project Kronos, uh, uh, I was told by Omar and Chris, some interest in it, so I'm gonna share a little bit more slides on that. And in particular, in this one, we work uh, hand in hand with PricewaterhouseCoopers, their, their global sustainability team for about six years. Over the years, I think we've, we've kind of, you know, shared this on various platforms. We've been a member of PRI, International Sovereign Wealth Fund, World Economic Forum, FCLT, et cetera, et cetera. After I left about two years ago, which I'll explain, uh, you know, so we were, I would say, a fairly early, I don't know about early, but certainly we were an advocate of thinking through stakeholder capitalism, so-called uh, responsible investment and II uh, impact investment philosophy. But there were other key drivers, which I'll go through. That I, I'm naming five of them uh, because I think one of these things uh, is I believe, you know, you can't just push one lever. You need, you need to push several levers at the same time to try and get a holistic set of, uh, of outcomes. As you can see, and you can begin to imagine it can get fairly complicated and complex actually. And this is uh, one of, I think the, the blind sides of this project is that it is actually difficult to sustain, which, which I, I, I accept, you know, uh, you know, given the, the nature and, some, and often political nature of this kind of sovereign funds. Okay, so that's a brief intro. Um, oops, okay, this is clicking one by one. So yeah, this slightly repeating. But you know, this is what financial returns mean to us, uh, what uh, strategic or economic returns means, and what societal returns mean. Like we, we can go back, but roughly, you know, essentially, as you know, you know uh, I mean, if I use a specific example, a wafer fabrication plant in Malaysia, and given where Malaysia was on its economic uh, development trajectory, it was very difficult to justify on pure financial terms. But when you start calculating input output tables uh, on what it contributes, you know, in terms of multiplier effect, in terms of knowledge effects, in terms of employment effects, uh, then the, the numbers actually start changing quite quickly. But who's going to bear that, right? So I think in some ways, a sovereign fund can do this easier uh, in some ways than, than a, a, a non-sovereign fund, right? Which obviously you have fiduciary and other duties. But arguably, we had, we had, we had all of them too. And really, how do we find the balance and the trade-offs? I think the devil is indeed in the details. And societal, and indeed the belief, uh, we are not of the camp that you know, we have to do everything, obviously. We pay taxes, by the way. Uh, you know, but we also created foundations where we saw on the public service delivery side, for example, there was either a lack of willingness or a lack of capability or a lack of capacity on the government side. Uh, so if I take an example on uh, you know, the, the, every year in Malaysia, about 150,000 graduates from Malaysian universities couldn't get jobs. Uh, frankly, I think the, the whole system of government universities were producing jobs that were not quite market ready. So, so in other words, the base system wasn't quite producing that. That's obviously a public sector job. But we stepped in 
uh, and we try to be proportionate about it, uh, we can't solve the whole 100,000, but every year we would do about 15, 20,000. That's quite a lot of money to basically reskill and then use our networks with the market and the employment market to try and place these people out. Uh, I mean, that's one example of where there's basically a state failure and we try to apply some of our capabilities on the market side uh, to, to do that. But obviously here, it's about balance, right? Because this, you can't overdo this. On the other hand, you know, trying to figure out what, what is the right mix. Okay, uh, I won't go through in this detail. These are some breakdowns of the kind of financial returns for what level of risk. Uh, for example, our asset cover, and later you will hear, uh, you know, we had to be quite careful how we manage uh, the liability side. And indeed, af after about four or five years of, we started in 04, the global crisis came in. And when we did some back testing, I think, you know, the companies that we were carrying from the Asian financial crisis, had it not been for some of these reforms and, you know, fairly moderate gearing and other, you know, some non-use of derivatives, for example, uh, we felt that, you know, by and large, many, a few com major companies would have gone into the red, if not for those kind of thinking, right? So obviously you have to look at risk as well. The economic stuff again, uh, you know, special economic zones, for example, um, to our colleagues from Singapore, Iskandar was an economic zone on the southern tip of Peninsular Malaysia facing Singapore that we, we, we basically were tasked with developing. And this very industrial policy, developmental work, if you apply the normal financial metrics, you, many of these projects would not have taken off, right? So we have, I think up to the point I left, I think we had hit something like about 70 billion US dollars of investments came in, of which we put in only about 10%. Uh, in other words, we use our network and convening power to bring other investors, you know, on the mid. So, so for example, Pinewood Studios from the UK, it's not the most natural place to set up a movie studio. But, you know, so those kind of structuring skills we try to bring in that looks at not just finance, but certainly economic metrics and, and the impact on the communities around there. Uh, knowledge development, again, you know, we set up think tanks, we did all kinds of stuff uh, and corporate investors. So, okay. That's the first driver. So, so the thinking that we were not just a sovereign fund, wealth fund, but it wasn't just about wealth, it's about development. And this is how we define. Along the way, the, the moniker sovereign development fund was given not by us, actually, it was by OECD, which I was a bit surprised. Uh, I think their, their, their growth center actually came up with this moniker. And uh, I mean, there's a whole bunch of literature on SWFs, as you know. So I think that's where we were just because of our context and our, our kind of, uh, you know, uh, provenance, if you like. The second driver was, you know, uh, as I reflect a bit now, we use a blend of public and pri private sector instruments. So about 70, 80% of our companies of that 37 billion were listed. Uh, but sometimes, you know, so we had, you know, a lot, Quite a lot of companies, but well, many did very well, as you know, as, as you heard, because you know, portfolio travel. But one company that didn't do well, and it was quite tragic, actually, Malaysia Airlines was one of our companies, as you know. It had the, 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 the very tragic twin disasters, right? So we, we had to take that off the market, do quite major restructuring. But just to indicate that when I had to lay off uh, something like 6,000 people, which is about 30% of their worker base, which for Malaysia, which does not have an, an unemployment benefit, safety net, 30% layoffs is a lot, okay? Uh, so no one has done this. Actually, we created a whole reskilling center and basically put 1%, which is about 60 million ringgit, about 15 million US dollars into reskilling these people. And in the end, about 80% of them, uh, we were able to redeploy and reskill. I think it's, it's that level of, you can see that we use both public private sector mindsets. And indeed my style, I came from investment banking. We were mostly, you know, people from banking, from strategy consultants and, and, and the thought and, uh, you know, a kind of a hybrid uh, approach. Eh? I think, again, there, there's a lot of stuff on that. Now, sorry, the, the key driver number three, actually, I need to highlight is at the end of the day, we can do all this macro theory. I think what really moves value is really at whether so the proverbial, you know, tire hits the road. And in this case, in about 20 companies, I think it's the old Pareto principle, the 20 companies for us was maybe about 80, 90% of the value. And indeed, it was actually about a third of the market cap of the Malaysian market. 
So we decided uh, fairly early on, and, and I was new to this, I think I had to learn this, to take a very intense, what is called a program management approach. Eh? So what this means is many thousand hours, you know, 29 meetings over a over 10 year period, you know, it was somewhat pedantic, I couldn't see it, you know, we, but, but the context was these were companies that were quite bombed out from the Asian crisis, right? So we had to put in governance codes, procurement codes, etc and many of these companies were listed companies so we we needed to make sure that we didn't upset this. so the kind of interventions had to be good interventions so this i would say was key driver number three like again this you know usually is a subject of one whole lecture separately uh, but so so the key point is that there are project management and then there are program management that we went through this whole thing through a program management process the fourth was to highlight as mentioned, because we don't have money coming in, as I mentioned, the oil money goes to Petronas, the foreign exchange reserve goes to the central bank, the pension money goes to our employee uh, pension fund, and, and they manage it very well, I must say, you know, by and large. Uh, we're not complaining, but it also almost forced us to, be, to approach what I call real and sensible finance. So for example, many of us came from you know, investment banking backgrounds. Uh, we decided early on that, you know, in terms of the risk appetite, given what we were, we had uh, to make sure that our risk uh, uh, tolerance here was relatively low. But it also meant, you know, things like we would we wouldn't get into derivatives. We had to obviously asset liability, risk management. And in the case of Malaysia and Omar is familiar in the UK. I think there's also an Islamic Finance uh, uh, Council. Uh, again, uh, this is quite. Uh, detail, but basically we 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 use certain principles there. We were often uh, leading in the work on uh, social bonds or social sukuks in how we finance ourselves and the CSR and the uh, you know activity. For example, this uh, sukuk of the the SRI sukuk, social responsible sukuk, sukuk the Islamic term for bonds, was done to finance uh, what we call our trust schools, which are essentially public-private partnerships for for government schools, right? So we took over the running, but but we 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 got the the other foundations and other pub members of the public to come and participate to fund this, uh, and so on, right? So so that I would say the fourth driver. And finally, in the context of uh, today, I understand um, you know the the measurement piece, and and we heard about impact measurement and management, and so we call this project Kronos. Uh, as I said, this started, you know, around about 2010, so about 10 years ago. And in this case, uh, you know, at that time, there were not many frameworks. There were, of course, you know, triple bottom line reporting, so all kinds of things. So we almost had to, you know, as best try to do, our, you know, ourselves. Uh, of course, we, with the help of PwC and, and, and other organizations that we were members of, right? Uh, so essentially the shareholder value, stakeholder value, and even within obviously the financial value. Uh, and one, one, I think maybe one distinguishing factor that we, we should highlight is the fact that Kazana, uh, the organization I led, was often, in most cases, was the, the major shareholder into these companies. So what that meant was we were in a privileged situation in terms of information, right? Obviously, we had to be careful about you know, insider trading laws and so on and so forth. In fact, in fact, these are in our street, we, we separated this from our trading portfolio, et cetera, right? In fact, we hardly did any trading for that matter. I think it was mostly in, uh, and it basically observes all the, the blackout periods, et cetera. But what it meant was we had certain sets of data. We took legal views that, for example, I was not a shadow director in spite of being the, the CEO uh, of, of, uh, of Kazana, the major shareholder. And we would dive in in great levels of detail because we had a lot of data, sometimes too much, frankly, and, and basically starts to differentiating. And as you can imagine, and you know, many on this call are, are, are experts in measurement, I think. So we called it sustainable adjusted value and economic and societal impact value, right? Uh, we view stakeholders, these are the stakeholder categories that we try to identify. So for example, employees, right? I mean, how do you quantify this? I mean, one of the reforms that we did under what we call the orange book, earlier you saw those 10, 10 colored books in our transformation program. Everybody had to go through what they, a kind of audit and employee engagement survey, for example. 
Uh, so, you know, uh, we don't want em employees, I mean, and the, the way the theory and the practice goes is that if your employee engagement survey result shows engagement of 95%, that's probably too happy. It sounds like a country club, that's not a company. Uh, but roughly, we think about 75, obviously, if it's 50%, that's morale is too low and that's a problem. Uh, roughly about 70 to 80% we think it's a good zone, so we have a certain way to try and evaluate this. Similarly, the environment, uh, development of vendors, supplier base, etc. Uh, I mean, these are some slides to try and explain the thinking between financial, economic and societal value, measuring economic value and managing societal value. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'll be the first to say that, you know, we were experimenting. Uh, in fact, the journey, I think is roughly the journey. And, you know, after I left, and this is one of the, 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 uh, the constraints or limitation of my, our sovereign development fund model, because the, the sovereign part means we are exposed to political changes, right? So after I left, uh, I believe this pro project is a little bit more bold. It may not have proceeded, although the discipline of tracking and moving, you know, the next stage was actually to come up quite publicly in Malaysia to say, let's take our power utility, which is one of the largest companies on the stock exchange in Malaysia called Tanaga, and market cap is, I don't know, say 30 billion US dollars. If we come out and say in our valuation, the true value is actually only 20 billion, I think that would create quite, quite major shockwaves. And, and why this is the difference and more, most importantly is the actions that we can take that we think we can half that, that uh, gap within the next five years. That was actually the next step, which I think they have not quite got around to that. Uh, they can still do so, but, but that brings me really to some concluding thoughts. Um, I hope I'm still on time, Graham. That I think three key points. I think the first point is really, uh, yes, I think at least for that period, whether it will stick, I think only, well, time will tell that we were, we believe we were able to deliver some notion of true value, maybe not, you know, everything there, but certainly the portfolio grew by, you know, slightly shy of 10% per annum for 14 years. We did do, you know, there's all kinds of data on the economic strategy return, the societal return. I mentioned in my view, as I reflect back now a little bit is, uh, you know, one, it starts with a mindset that really said, in 2004, at a time when this was swimming against the tide somewhat. So I remember actually sitting down with Stern Stewart, um, uh, you know, the people who did EVA, right? Uh, because some sovereign funds actually measure, in fact, we do measure economic profit, not quite EVA, i.e. hence the notion of cost of capital, et cetera, right? But we felt that we needed a broader metrics back even in 04. So it starts with the mindset of, you know, picking and choosing your true north. In our case, for various reasons, we said the building through value and becoming a sovereign development fund was the first kind of, you know, quite foundational, uh, you know, uh, philosophy, if you like. The second is, you know, to take a pragmatic approach and not to get dogmatic, as in the word dogma was raised earlier, or, or you know, tied down or trapped into, you know, whether state or markets to all that kind of debate. Whatever works, we take it. You know, the famous Deng Xiaoping saying, doesn't matter if the cat is black or white as long as it catches rat. And, you know, although many of us had to learn new skills, we were not, you know, usually we were not so amphibious to be able to move between these two worlds, but over time we did. The third one was to do program management. The fourth one is watch your liability side carefully. The, the final lever is in a way, you know, this notion of true value and key performance indicators and measurement uh, and indeed the management of that measurement. Uh, in this case, we, we have access because of control levers. So nonetheless, I should highlight uh, the projects and program were covered the majority of state land companies. It was not all encompassing. I think there were parts that were not part of our program. Most notably, you, would, you, would, you, may, you may recognize is the infamous 1MDB scandal. I mean, this is... Uh, to my frustration and to many of us, but you know, it was outside our program. In fact, you know, I would get rating agencies coming to see us and say, oh, very good, et cetera, because we had some you know, bonds or sukuks issued, right? And they would cheekily ask, how is your evil twin doing? You know, because we do share the common parent, right? The sovereign fund. Uh, so, you know, so that's one uh, limitation, actually. Second, the longevity of this program, 
uh, is also susceptible, obviously, this is its uh, Achilles heel, if you like, to changes in political landscape and resulting changes to commitment to reforms. Uh, nonetheless, I think it still had a, a kind of a net positive impact, in my view, um, in that you know, we, we were able to deliver and many of these things were institutionalized and they're still going on. So for example, uh, you know, I, we created an umbrella uh, foundation body. I carved out a billion US dollars on, on a particularly good and profitable year. And this umbrella body now, uh, looking at basically our philanthropic work, is supporting about 40, 50 uh, social and NGO organizations. Right? And they can't, very difficult to reverse this because of trust laws and so on and so forth. You know, whatever changes in, 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 in the types of, uh, you know, the political vicissitudes, if you like, right? So, uh, a final couple of minutes, I suppose, on, uh, I was also asked to comment briefly on the post-pandemic world. I don't have that much to add, and I, you know, because I think both Dean and Amy have highlighted what the sentiment and trends are, and I, I generally agree. I just wanted to add maybe one kind of, um, perspective, uh, I think closely linked to the staff of work I'm trying to think about uh, in some of my quasi-academic role at Cambridge, which is around what is the impact about the financial system ultimately on society. And I think the big, the big one currently, as we know, is actually obviously you know, the impact of the unnatural monetary policy, which has now, we, we're talking about new normal, but this, this, this abnormal situation has become you know, quite long, right? since the 08 crisis and it's been more than 10 years and therefore I thought a good uh, a good way of describing it I think came out in the FT the last couple of weeks they call about a K a K-shaped recovery so a K-shaped recovery means you know a divergent recovery between I suppose haves and have-nots but I would maybe try to modify that a bit by calling it a KK recovery the first K being the difference between the real economy and the and the market right obviously there's there's a kind of a you know, big divergence, right? And then within the market itself, as you know, uh, you know, it's a very narrow kind of uh, bounce of the, I mean, the, 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 the five, six big tech stocks plus pharma and a few other sectors, right? And certainly that division between capital uh, and labor and society, I think this is the worry. And my own belief is that yes, those trends are going. But because if we believe those unnatural, monetary conditions actually are resulting in you know, rents or windfall gains for, for the few, very few. Uh, taxation is certainly one lever, but whether through regulation, through love or through fear, changes will have to happen. I think it will. The issue is, well, can it be orderly? I think it must be orderly, it has to be orderly. And indeed, the work on impact and other you know, variations and cousins of impact uh, needs to therefore have an impact. Thank you. I'll stop there. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Well, look, thanks very much, Asma. Now you've the, again, you've given us a huge amount there to think about, and uh, a huge amount of detail in your slides, which I appreciate uh, <clears throat> was more than was possible to cover within the the, the allocated time. We're very grateful for you. Uh, providing all that, and I'm hopeful that, that uh, if we're permitted to circulate these afterwards, people will be able to look at them in more detail at, the, at their leisure, which will be great. Um, I'm conscious of the clock moving on, so I want to press right on to, to, to questions. Um, some of these are directed to particular speakers, and uh, uh, I will direct those, but if, if, any, if, I, if either of the other two speakers have got something to say, just feel free to, to jump in. Uh, Dean, we'll start with you, seeing you've had a, a chance to kind of uh, draw breath well, for the longest. I have a couple of questions specific to you. Um, if I can uh, get this going here. Yes, one from uh, uh, Edward Harkins. It says, you reported a high degree of confidence and positivity among investors going forward, quote, despite the headwinds, unquote. Could you please say something more about what you see as the key drivers specific to impact investment for confidence remaining intact? So, I mean, the, um, I, I think that, um, and Amy spoke to this as well, is, is that investors are very much seeing the opportunity that actually lies there. Um, one of the other questions that sits in the chat box is, is that um, people are asking the question about why we should be finance first, and whether all investments shouldn't be impact first. Uh, um, you know, 
the, the point is, is that it, at a time like this, it highlights deep inequalities in this world, deep um, areas of, of gap, um, where many people in the world are not being served appropriately um, by the financial system and other um, infrastructure um, to support them. So, you know, investors are going to see opportunity in that. And I think that that's very welcome, particularly if they are values-based in some kind of way and really want to make a contribution and a difference um, to the world that they actually live in. I agree with Amy that, you know, even if you're just seeing that from an ESG or risk mitigation strategy, that's not impact investing, but it is a starting point, potentially, or it is better than not doing anything. But what, um, what that, the flows that Amy referred to indicate that, that there's actually much more capital where people see um, the potential for, for doing, um, you know, for, um, for making a difference. I realize that what that can lead to is the idea that people see value in, um, in others' misfortune. Um, I don't believe that impact washing is, is a result of specific nefarious intent. Um, it's, you know, there are obviously bad actors out there, but um, I'd like to think that most of the time the impact washing actually really only happens unintentionally because people don't carefully account, don't carefully firstly set goals um, as to what they want to achieve and account and act transparently um, both with their stakeholders um, and their um, um, the people that might benefit from the results that the impact results that they're actually hoping to achieve. I've summed up a lot in that answer. I hope that covers it. I was, go I was going to just riff off something that you said, Dean, there as well. Yeah. I think, um, there's, a, there's a question in the chat, which I think plays into some of what um, Dean has, has just said. Whilst I do think there are some players in the marketplace who are nefariously hijacking impact, um, I do think that generally speaking, there is a huge amount of good intent out there. What happens is there's not, there, there is a lack of expertise as to how to execute um, and also what impact actually is, you know, versus sustainable investing. Um, and, and just to, to really agree and, and, and hammer home something that, um, that Dean just said, all investing is impact investing because every time you invest in something, you create either a positive and or a negative externality. And the trick is in understanding where that balance lies between the net positive and the net negatives and then saying, okay, on balance, where are we? Um, but because of that, and because I think everybody's now waking up to that, we're seeing this flood of products coming in saying this is an impact driven investment. Um, and, you know, we're creating X amount of, um, you know, positive externality as a result of this without being able to understand the negative footprint still embedded within that. Um, and also without really having clear intent. And I think that's where the impact investing really differs. It's the clear intent that a fund manager or an investor has from the word go to create a net positive result. That's the difference between what we would say much more authentic and robust impact investing and then some of the lighter kind of washes that you, you, you see out in the marketplace. But a lot of that does come down to whether or not the industry itself is actually equipped to understand the difference in the different forms, the different shades, the different tones and patterns um, of impact. I don't think it currently is. Um, I think, you know, we have, um, we have investments at play through CFA and CISI in, in the UK looking to better equip some of the frontline staff to understand what this means when they're advising. But this is why it's so important that diversity and inclusion and our drive to diversity and inclusion focuses on the traditional, some of the more traditional measures around ethnicity, sexuality, gender, et cetera. Socioeconomic diversity is absolutely key in finance. We have to crack open that socioeconomic um, uh, sort of box and make sure that the system is more inclusive of, of that, but also talent and skills. And the flood, I think, of sustainability and impact investors coming into finance now is absolutely what's required. The real individuals uh, with the knowledge, but also the real individuals with the lived in experience. That's the science community, those who are benefiting ultimately from the investments that are being made. We have to crowd all of these people in to make sure we're making the right decisions. Um, so that's where I think we do get some of the washing because there's people interpret it overly simplistically. Um, and as a result, you get these 
grand statements about how we're changing the world and when you actually look at what they're doing they are but not the way they think they are okay i i just to sort of follow on from that here's a question which was directed to you amy from uh Sutrita kamath if i've got that name right uh which is maybe tangential to what you've just been saying which says given everything you just laid out does the term finance first investor even make sense sitting within within impact investing shouldn't impact investing by default be only about impact first investing and isn't this one of the things that could contribute to impact washing uh, i agree i entirely agree i i, I think i uh, it always annoys me when we have this conversation around impact first uh, or finance first um versus impact and impact first versus finance and you know ultimately at the end of the day we are looking for good investments and the good investments i think we all now know are those investments that are focusing on uh, writing the imbalances in the system. Um, you know, these are well-run businesses that are solving the world's global sort of social and economic problems. So if we're just talking about impact investing as being good investing, um, and we're focusing on therefore what the world really needs, what value can be created for the world through this business, then I think we can move away from some of that finance first versus impact first. Uh, narrative. I do think some of that, uh, that language does lead to the impact washing that's going on out there. I think a lot of the language in the system, to be honest with you, leads to uh, has led us to where we are um, and is keeping us, I think, from realizing our, our, our full potential. I think we have to be really open to um, understanding the ramifications of the language that we use. I'm a great believer in plain English, um, you know, call a spade a spade. <laughs> um, and um, language in the system little bit like law and I'm sorry if there are any lawyers on, on the call now I'm a, I'm a climate and soil scientist by background um, but language has been developed in finance as a defense mechanism it's been designed to keep people out um, it's been designed to keep people like me out didn't work I got in um, but um, you know it is designed as a, as a mechanism through which people are kept at arm's length um, you know we manage your money you don't need to worry about this we know what we're doing we'll create the financial performance you require. We have to tackle the language. Um, and if we can tackle the language, then again, we play a role in democratizing the system and moving it beyond um, into something I think far, far, far more powerful. Well, I have to fess up to being a lawyer, so uh, I probably have to plead guilty to, to, to the accusation you're putting out there. Moving on quickly, just, just as a final follow-up on that same theme, uh, here, here, here's a question. Uh, on, 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 again, relating to, to, to impact washing, is it time to name and fame and or name and shame? I don't know, Dean, do you want to answer that or are you Amy? Or indeed, you as man as the case may be. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take it. I, I, I think that, um, that, you know, accountability is an important element of it. I'm not so sure that um, sometimes naming and shaming um, is is often helpful. I think what it does is actually drive behavior below the radar, which is which is even less helpful. But I think what's important to note here is is that there there is a continued ecosystem development that is actually going on. A, um, Amy alluded to some of the things that that are happening, as did I. Is is that you know the the need for disclosure and the fact that there are groups of people to walk to um, pushing how firmly that disclosure actually is required. Um, um, debates around fiduciary duty, um, things like benchmarks, for example. I mean, one of the things that the GIN is doing um, is developing impact performance benchmarks, the methodology that actually sits behind how do you compare um, one impact performance opportunity, to one impact investment opportunity to another in order to make sure that you allocate capital to the best possible solution. So much more bang for your impact dollar or pound, if you want to call it that, um, so that um, you understand and you're able to track where you, what, what impact is actually best or good enough um, under sets of circumstances. Um, the, the quality of data and how people can access it. So imagine a world where every analyst has an, an, an impact terminal on their desk in the same way that they might have a a Bloomberg terminal, for example. So, you know, those kinds of infrastructure development are actually going to drive probably the positive um, performance things that, that we actually, or the, the, the 
people to do this or execute properly. And that's, that's what will, will happen. You know, in the early days of impact investing, we didn't even have a metric to define what a quality job was. We now have those kinds of things and it will be an evolution over a period of time. Mm. Graham, as I was say, Graham, there's a really cracking question in the in the chat. Is this um, what, the one from John up there? Was, was good it's the it's the one. Hang on a minute. Let me just, it's from Craig around. Oh um, yeah, well that one's just this event. Just one. I think that's just come through. Yes, that's right. Well, well, should we go into that? I was going. I was going to pick up another comment out of the questions, but let, let's let's have a look at this, which is about uh, essentially about the time. The time things take, isn't it? The, the, it said, oh, well, I'll just read it quickly so people can understand. Recently, I heard from a female leader in the responsible investment sector world say that in the FS sector, the gender pay gap was being taken seriously about 20 years ago, but we're still talking about it. How can firms focus on the SDG goal number 10 uh, of reducing inequalities seriously and in a way where we can reduce the inequality gap at a faster pace, indeed in time for the UN's goal to achieve these by 2030? Can this be done appropriately, even if it is deemed as being positive discrimination? Not sure how it's best to answer this, says Craig McKellar, who's asking the question. So I will see who jumps in first. But it sounded like you got thoughts on it, Amy. Well, I was just going to say, it's really interesting. One of the things I was going to talk about earlier, there were a couple of things that I didn't mention when I was chatting earlier, which I think are really, really important driving us forward. One is intergenerational politics. And Asman, when you were talking about, obviously, sovereign development funds, um, uh, kind of versus sovereign wealth funds, you got my attention. I was like, okay, this is really, really interesting now because it's the confluence between that and taxation and how can we create more sovereign development funds through effective taxation. Law is where we focus on here for this question and the use of law. So looking at litigation um, uh, to drive the change that's required more. And I think the confluence between law and finance is only just starting to happen. Um, you, you look at... Um, the work, for example, that Client Earth are doing on um, uh, uh, sort of you know planetary rights, for want of a better expression, you know, uh, defending uh, nature through the use of litigation and um, ensuring that people are actually delivering on the commitments that have been made, for example, in the Paris Climate Accord, whether it's the UK um, government on their air pollution strategy, etc. We're now starting to see impact investing cut funds coming through that are focusing on impact investing capital going into these types of law firms who are working to address not just some of the planetary issues, but the social issues. For example, um, inequality in pay, um, you know, poor working conditions. The rise of the activist lawyer alongside the rise of the activist investor is only just starting. Um, but it's incredibly exciting, I think, to see where that goes. Um, because we know that with finance, you know, we can, ch we can kind of choke, for want of an expression, we can kind of choke the air supply a little bit by squeezing, you know, the financial flow through to, to businesses. But with law, you can throw the full weight of a justice system at them as well. And between the two, I think that that's the kind of the magic formula to drive the change that we need far more quickly. Mm. Uh, Aslan, do you want to come on anything on that? Mute. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the, the data on pay on gender gap uh, in Malaysia, I am not um, as familiar, I must say, but certainly in the organizations that I led, you know, we, we, we tried to ensure that, you know, obviously it's based on work done and performance. I think, but one data that I do know is, uh, you know, participation of women and other minority groups in leadership positions. I think this over a 10 year period at more or less double, I think our rate is now roughly about 20 to 25%. I think when we started, that was about 10, 12% or thereabouts. I believe those numbers while still short of the 30% target, you know, maybe compass reasonably, I mean, I think a lot of other developed markets may, may as to my understanding, may not reach that, of course, in the, Scandies and so on, I think it's, uh, I mean, so I, I think certainly, uh, I mean, I just wanted to echo that the point about benchmarks and standards that was covered earlier, I think uh, it's quite a noisy space, right? And I think the, 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 the I, I also do tend to agree business leaders, you know, have to balance so many things. I don't think, I think, you know, like any, any distribution uh, graphs, there, there's always some bad hats, but by and large, 
I think no one really goes out to, to, to do a bad thing. Everybody wants to do shades of a good thing. And once in a while, you get some really inspirational breakthrough stories. I think we need to soldier on. I think those who are doing standards, bringing people together, intermediation, running sovereign funds, not running sovereign funds, whatever. I think, you know, the, all these things need to come together. And perhaps, you know, COVID is the, well, hopefully is a trigger. My, my biggest worry remains the, those monetary conditions. It's not conceptual anymore, right? We, we feel it, we know it's there. And, but the genie, how do we put that back in the bottle? I think that you have to manage and use the genie, I suppose. So those who are lucky enough to have capital and make those extra gains, either they get taxed or they should, you know, do impact or certainly do no harm and, you know, create foundations and, and drive that at a much higher scale. Because essentially, in the absence of a windfall tax, I think that's what they have to do. Otherwise, you know, the chickens will come home to roost, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we're almost out of time, I'm afraid, but uh, uh, just, just uh, picking up on one, much, almost as much a comment, I think, as a question that came in, which I think is very much following on from everything. It's just the, the, the last discussion from John Utley saying, and this takes things back from our international dimensions there to, 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 to the local, to apparently to the local situation here in Scotland, but I think is much more, or much wider application. Can we develop an envi environmental impact assessment in mature political economies like Scotland without placing measures of well-being centre stage? It seems to me that land tenure, accounting practices, public policy, etc., create massive inertia that constrains change. Well, uh, it's not really a question; it's a comment, but it seems to me to be, uh, 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 lead back to some of the answers you were just giving a minute, uh, a minute or two ago, Amy. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I, I think again, it comes down to what's the definition of well-being, um, and you know how are we thinking about well-being. There is there is huge political inertia, um, even in mature uh, political environments like Scotland. There is still be especially in them. <laughs> <laughs> there is still political inertia. I think it comes back to some of what I was saying or alluding to earlier, which is when Asman was talking and my, my brain was kind of firing off, kind of going, ah, this is what I was thinking about mentioning earlier was the intergenerational nature of politics. And you look at things, for example, like the future generation bill that Lord Bird is trying to get through Westminster. Now we already have iterations of that in Wales, iterations in Scotland. We've got iterations in some of the Scandi countries. We've got um, intergenerational climate laws now coming into place in um, Denmark. Um, as well, which will hold successive governments to key targets um, and programs that have been set. And I think, I, I think there is real room here for a conversation around the type of cross-party political collaboration and intergeneral, intergenerational kind of political collaboration that is going to be required to drive the regulatory um, environment to enable us to deploy the types of assets that we need to in the timetable time that we need to um, as well. Now, that in itself is quite a, it's quite a, you know, it's a big area. I'm, you know, I'm not a political expert, but, you know, thinking about political reform such that you can create healthier dialogue and more effective public governance is a big area. It's a huge area. Um, and I'm sure like finance, it's not an easy area either. Um, but we're seeing we're seeing the early stages of this starting to happen, um, you know, through things like Future Generations Bill, through, through things like the, um, uh, the new Dan Danish climate law. So it's possible, you know, it is absolutely possible. Everything's possible. It all comes down to intent and will. And I think that's why I sort of said earlier that we have pretty much everything that we need to do what we need to do. The question is whether we have the courage to do it. That's a splendid note to, 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 to conclude on, because I'm afraid to say we've run out of time. Uh, I, the, 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 just as the debate was opening up into very wide topics indeed, um, I'm afraid, as I say, the clock has slightly overrun already, and despite the fact that we have many more questions here, uh, I, I'm afraid, to be fair to everyone, we have to stick to our, our timetable, and um, I will have to draw the line at that point. We, we've a few questions in from our own team, including I see one asking why we haven't picked up any of Omar's questions. And the answer to that is family hold back is the rule of them, Jeffy. So uh, 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 guests' questions come first. Um, uh, 
just before we, we um, pack up, can I just draw everyone's attention to the fact that in not much more than a month now will be our big uh, event for the year, our annual conference, Ethical Finance 2020. I think at our last, I'm right in saying that our last uh, round table, it still wasn't quite clear whether everything would be online or not, but to, to nobody's great surprise, that is indeed the case. So this year, instead of cramming it into two long days uh, of actual meetings, we will be having uh, four days of virtual conference uh, spread over uh, slightly shorter timetables. Um, 5th to the 8th of October. My uh, colleagues will be sending you around more info on this as part of the follow-up to this meeting, uh, but the details are already all there on the website, Jeffy's website, and I commend these to you to explore. Uh, uh, as Amazon tells us, if you, uh, if you enjoyed this, we think you'll like that, or at least some of it. So I hope to uh, hope that you'll join us to the events, uh, the events there, which only leads me, I think, to say a few words of thanks. First and foremost, obviously, there are three speakers today who've been absolutely super. We've uh, had a huge amount to think about, and uh, we're very grateful for their, for their thoughtful, engaging uh, uh, contributions and for, for giving up their time to, to share their knowledge with us today. It's, I certainly feel I've, I've, I've learned quite a bit. Um, thanks too to the Jeffy team behind the scenes. These things don't just happen. Uh, I'm grateful to everybody who's been involved in putting this together. And finally, thanks to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, who've been with us for this meeting. Uh, we've been very pleased at the level of uptake and interest in it. Uh, we hope you'll join us next time around. There will be another roundtable meeting before the end of the year. Uh, about around about the beginning of December uh, and uh, the date and the topic for that will be disseminated through the usual channels and uh, I hope that as many of you as possible will join us again then. However, for today I think that is it. So as the man on Radio 4 used to say, if you have been, thank you for listening.